So I'm here at the Green Space Cafe in Ferndale, Michigan, and I'm excited to share with you uh, Joel Kahn, Dr. Joel Kahn, who is a cardiologist uh, here in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I got to know Joel uh, because, as some of you know, but many of you may not, I actually have a plant-based diet. But don't leave the podcast yet. Uh, Joel is uh, known uh, nationally and internationally as a doctor that helps to re uh, reverse heart disease. And this is an important subject for all of you high performers out there. Um, and Joel is not just a cardiologist, he's an entrepreneur and an amazing leader, which you will, all, all, which you will also find out uh, during our talk together today. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Joel Kahn. Dr. Joel Kahn, thank you for being on the Do Nothing podcast. This is a thrill to be with you. Yeah, I had <laughs> a very valued space in my schedule. I want to dedicate it to uh, your very loud uh, and important voice with executives and people striving to be better. It's a good thing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, nailing you down is a challenge. I don't know how you do everything that you do. Do you get asked that a lot? Um, I, yeah, people I'm amazed. Comment on that. <laughs> and I actually do sleep. Uh, you know, I split my time pretty efficiently. And, you know, you make decisions in life you have, too. There was one golf in my life, a very small little interest. And in, yeah. you know, this time of year, it's not even an issue. Things like that. Yeah. But it's work, work out, contribute, mm -hmm. recycle uh -huh. that uh, schedule again. Yeah. How many hours of sleep do you need? Well, um, I... I need or shoot for about seven hours. I seven really hours. do. And I found, you know, I don't put it on my calendar, but I'm pretty cognizant that 10 to 5 is seven hours or <laughs> 11 to 6. And so uh, I do try to get the habit of getting to bed, you know, relatively reasonably early uh -huh. at night. Which is around 10. Yeah, around 10, 10 yeah. to 11. And then, you know, I like waking up with the sunlight or earlier. Mm -hmm. Always a workout. Always every, a workout. Every day. Yeah. yeah, I always like to ask what uh, my guests' morning routines are, and for me, I wake up and do nothing, which is a meditation okay. routine when I wake up. But what do you do? Yeah, I um, generally don't have to set an alarm uh, internally. Wake up. I also have three rescue dogs at home. That two of the three, or three of the three, are on the bed, and <laughs> although that's the greatest joy in life, it also pretty much make sure I'm going to be waking up a little earlier than maybe my body clock would otherwise. Somebody's moving around. Um, I say a few minutes of gratitude every single morning before getting out of bed, before touching my phone, a uh, little old Hebrew prayer that goes back, you know, at least a thousand years or more. Mm -hmm. Another one that goes back much longer than that. Uh, so before I pop out of bed, I try and have that sense. I mean, there was a day that the phone or the beeper would go off at three in the morning. It was literally jumping some scrubs and hundred miles an hour to the hospital. I, have transitioned my cardiology practice to still a very vigorous one, but I don't do that anymore. But there's always going to be some workout in the morning. And uh, we were joking before, it's very much often time efficient workout during the week, a lot of <laughs> high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. I have kind of a high intensity interval yoga. We were joking, I have high intensity interval meditation. <laughs> I got everything uh, you know, during the week to maybe spend half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, uh, being active. Uh, I have some heroes on the internet that I like to follow in fitness. Uh, one's a guy named Ben Greenfield, America's number one fitness expert. Uh -huh. He's a friend of mine and he dances around like a crazy man. He calls it kind of Tai Chi dancing. <laughs> uh -huh. in, the, in the confines of my basement, you can do what you want and I do usually work out no at home. Kidding. So I've uh, added that two minutes into the routine. The other thing I've added, just we could talk about it, is some new uh, medical data that if you can do 40 or more push-ups in two minutes or less, it may be a better sign of fitness than even going for an executive, physical executive stress test. So mm -hmm. uh, that that's new, and I've kind of added in 45, 50 push-ups in the morning it. to the, but that's that's time efficient anyway. <laughs> and I will say, I don't have any endorsement. This is a sleep tracking ring. Yes. Probably the top one on the market, heart rate, sleep, depth of sleep, REM sleep. Yep. Uh, something called heart rate variability, which goes into meditation yoga. So I don't wear it every single night, but um, 
I keep an eye on it. And just it's the it's Aura going. Ring. It is. And you and I were talking about. I have mine oh, on as well. Right, yeah, right. we were talking it about it uh, yeah, the other right, day. Right. Right. And um, yeah, I I just got it um, maybe two or three weeks ago. Right. And it's really interesting how accurate it is. Yeah. And so you're you, right. You've had yours a while. You were as most things. You're a first well, mover I in met, the health uh, world. I met the founder. I don't know a year ago. Yeah. And he, he got me the first version, which was quite a big prominent ring you felt like you know, won the Super Bowl or something and then they've slimmed it down to look like you're married twice <laughs> um, but it also takes away all sympathy because I actually thought I slept poorly last night in terms of hours yeah checked my app and it's only because I went to bed early that it uh, told me that the truth was stop moaning and groaning <laughs> and I feel fine so uh, it, it is interesting I've had a number of patients tell me I don't like that thing. I really thought I had a sleep problem, and it tells me I'm sleeping just fine. <laughs> I mean, I get no sympathy anymore for my spouse and such. So, so you go a little deeper than that when, when you start to realize maybe sleep wasn't the issue, and then yeah. there's other things you can yeah, start to look at. Yeah, other reasons for fatigue, right? Yeah, you know, right. You don't need metrics at every single thing that, you know, yeah. what do they call it, the Internet uh, of why, or, you know, where everything will have Bluetooth on it. I'm not a big fan of that, but yeah. sleep has become such a, you know, critical, high-function mm -hmm. goal. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's pretty cool to track it. One of the things that you do on your YouTube channel yeah. are these videos, like, almost every day. Again, yeah. I'm amazed at how you fit all this in. It's so cool. Uh, and I happened to see the one on the push-ups, and I thought that was really yeah. interesting because you talked about the stress test. Right. And I believe you said something to the extent that maybe that isn't as much of an accurate gauge on some things as maybe the push-ups are. Well, you know, we can go down any road you like, and hopefully a lot of people listening to this are in kind of the executive world. And they that's are. kind of where my yeah. practice is cardiology, executive health, executive health optimization. Yep. You know, if you, if you go see your internist at age 50, and it doesn't matter the top person in the city wherever you live, um, insurance won't pay for a stress test. Uh, it's been looked at. There are so many false readings both ways. You actually have a heart problem and the stress test didn't pick it up so you kind of get a false reassurance. Or you have an abnormality that phone call rings and the internist family doc says, you know, we got a little thing here, you need to go see the heart doc. And you know, a few weeks later you've been through a whole bunch of stuff and find out there never was anything wrong, kind of false alarm that um, unless you're having something on an electrocardiogram or symptoms, an executive stress test is done in a lot of executive physical settings. Yeah. It's not really supported by the data because of accuracy issues. So if it's 100% accurate, we do it all the time. Um, but yet, the fitness component is predictable, and one of the best places in the world has been in Dallas, the Cooper Clinic, Kenneth Cooper, MD, wrote the book Aerobics way back, uh, maybe early 70s, before health clubs were everywhere and made the point that, you know, intense cardio of various kinds was so beneficial. And they've got the most amazing data in the tens of thousands of members of the Cooper Clinic uh, Fitness Center. Now that duration on a treadmill has very important meaning for longevity. If you want to know um, 40, 50, 60, 70, I mean, how many years ahead, one parameter that's relatively simple is a treadmill. So yeah. it's not so much for the diagnosis of heart oh. disease for predicting, you know, real an integrated look at fitness, assuming mm -hmm. you got good hips and good back and can do a treadmill test. The push-up thing is, you know, when it was compared head-to-head -head in this Harvard study of a thousand firefighters about age 40 to 55, it was even more predictable. It separated those that developed heart disease a decade later, later from those that didn't, even better than a firefighter stress test. And in the firefighter population, a stress test probably is reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a high-risk population. They've got the public health at you know their hands. But yeah. uh, all you got to do is drop down, give me 40, <laughs> under two minutes, and you're pretty golden in under terms of... Under two minutes? That, that's what the parameter was in this single study okay. that was recently published. Okay. I love so that. it's... You can take a break. It doesn't have to be relentless. Yeah. I, and really, that was what they did in the study. I mean... Somebody wants to put their knees down and do five push-ups and build up, great. You want to get your kitchen counter or your desk at work and use it to uh, do push-ups off of as your introduction to all this, great. But mm -hmm. I can already tell there's a whole lot more people doing a whole lot more push-ups than there were three four weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Anything that gets people moving yeah. in a safe and uh, you know, hopefully sustained manner is, is a welcome you know, piece of uh, headline. Do you ever take a day off 
from exercise during the week? I mean, do you, Ian, do you recommend that? The first part, do I ever take a day off? Not really. I, I, I haven't gotten to Stephen Covey's sharp in the saw for a while because <laughs> um, uh, I like everything I do pretty much all day. Uh, I do take probably six days a week I work out. And, okay. Um, if it's either a time crunch or a little bit of muscle soreness from a good weight workout. Mm -hmm. um, I was introduced about two years ago to an eight-minute yoga flow called the Five Tibetans. I had done yoga for 25 years, mm -hmm. uh, like everybody at a, you know, the local hot studio, uh, literally hot many times. Yeah. But, you know, that's an hour class most of the time, and it's the drive, and it's the park, and it's the shower. Absolutely. You know? So when I learned that there was this ancient flow, five Tibetans, and I've written about it, or people can look it up, and it's all core and back flexibility, and hot room, cold room, hotel room, kitchen. I do it on my kitchen floor a lot of times. So I pretty much never skip a day where I do that because I can tell you the rest of the day, standing, sitting, moving, back just feels awesome. And I don't really wow. have any problem, but I attribute part of it to this like consistent ritual of yeah. uh, some back bands and some uh, kind of uh, jackknife kind of motions. You know, okay. there's some people that would need to be cautious doing it, but it's, yeah. I wouldn't call it very aggressive movement. How long does that take you? Did you say yeah, that? Yeah, it's five it. moments, or there actually is a secret sixth Tibetan. 21 times is the goal. I would bet it's eight minutes or less. Eight minutes yeah. or less. Yeah, so yeah. it's that H-I-I-T yoga. <laughs> I love it. you got to get it all in. Yeah. <laughs> We're, all, we're always looking for the fast way the to hack. get it done, you know, right? I yeah. use that word a lot. How do you hack your yoga? Yeah. How do you hack your meditation? How do yeah. You, yeah. You don't want to hack everything in life. Something should be savored and enjoyed. But, yeah. uh, you know, the list can be pretty long, you know. Floss, brush, you know, <laughs> everything just adds up. So I, I welcome any efficiency tool that's out there. I can tell that. No Tim you. Ferriss, but, you know, I recognize <laughs> things like that are beneficial. Uh, so you, you mentioned your cardiologist and that's your training, but you know, how I know you, uh, at the outset is when you started to open this beautiful restaurant. And so to me, you're an entrepreneur and, um, and, and that goes back in your family, I believe, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, grandfather and father embarked the year I was born, which is just about turning 60 now. Um, and I furniture store in Detroit proper yeah. at the time that, you know, most of the business was in Detroit proper. And then they grew that ultimately, I think, I don't know if there's eight or nine pretty large stores uh, run by my sister and brother-in-law still within the family. Yep. But as a kid, I was in warehouses. I was at, you know, July 4th sales. I was driving high lows. I was delivering furniture and, you know, saw how hard people worked. And uh, I wasn't like on the floor selling much. I had figured out by age 16, 17, I was going into medicine, even though the retail part was very appealing and working with my father was a very enticing opportunity, but I just somehow figured uh, out that my really greatest strength seemed to be science, and I don't know where that came from. Interesting. I mean, yeah, so, but you're right. There was always that aspect. My mother was the first model for the company, and <laughs> I can remember going to photo shoots and probably when I was eight or nine and, mm -hmm. you know, primitive studios by today's conception. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneurial world was around you growing up even though you knew at an early age you were probably headed towards medicine yep yeah very early yep yep just, just, you know fortunately a very good decision I, I i don't know how the furniture world would have turned out i think i would have enjoyed that <laughs> but i just i'm the happiest physician anybody will ever see i, I think the world's better for the decision well, you made. i'll you. tell you that yes. much uh, and i have my personal story that i'll share with that with you with the listeners in a minute on that but um so you went to university of michigan yeah they had a program a, a quick little story but it's funny they they i didn't even know it but when i got my application and at the time i was a good high school student i wasn't number one but i was in the top 25 um you apply to one college i mean that's the only thing i applied to university of michigan didn't apply to 40 schools like some kids do but there was one little box. If you're interested in the integrated pre-medical medical program, check the box. We'll send you information, obviously pre-internet. And that turned out to be a six-year concentrated program where you were accepted directly into med school. Never did the, um, I don't even remember the name of the test people take, MGATS, uh, because yeah. I never had to. And 
interviewed, took a couple psychological tests. It was no really kidding. to see if you were age 17, uh, you know, determined and whatever profile they figured was going to be successful. Yeah. It was actually geared to uh, pump out more primary care docs at a time. Very much like right now, there's a bit of concern there aren't enough primary care docs for the population. Mm -hmm. Nobody that went through the program became a primary care doctor. <laughs> Brain surgeons at UCLA and ophthalmologists and cardiologists and all. I'm sure there's a few primary care docs. But it was just, you know, I got a letter when I had just turned 18 that I was accepted to med school. And it was just a, a, another. It was the high intensity. It was, I hacked med school. <laughs> Never thought of it that way, but shaved two years off wow. in a program that was... Yeah, you know, my class size was 50. Everybody else had 250, 300. Yeah. The last couple of years, we integrated with the main med school uh, on rotations. They called it the baby docs because okay. we were, on average, a couple of years younger yeah. at the same level. But I ended up graduating, you know, summa cum laude, so I kicked their butt. <laughs> did you know that you wanted to be a cardiologist early on, or did how did you figure yeah, that out? I had a trivial little thing, but I had a little heart murmur as a mm -hmm. kid, and I started seeing, really, before I have memory of it, at yeah. six months old, three months old, and throughout uh, my childhood. It never amounted to anything, but I can just remember machines and diode screens and all kinds of stuff, and just I'm sure that was the biggest influence. Yeah. I have a great picture of my pediatric cardiologist, uh, I must have been about two or three examining me in the crib with a cigarette in his hand. So <laughs> reflects the, the Good era. times. Yeah, the era. I mean, is yeah. that nuts? Yeah, I think it was about 65 that, you know, the Jeez. biggest warning about smoking and cancer came out and some rules started to come out. But prior to that, yeah, yeah it was. Like everybody's seen those ads. Doctors were We've endorsing them. Yep. Well, they were real. And, and now you talk about today's, which we'll, we'll talk a yeah, bit more right, about. Right. It, it, we just have a different a, cigarette. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, what was your household like? What was the con household well, like? Well, actually, where we're sitting, I grew up first 10 years of my life about a mile from here and go back once in a while, man, a thousand square feet. And uh -huh. I don't know how many rooms shared a bedroom with my brother, one bathroom. Uh, my parents had just launched this retail business and, um, you know, you, like everybody would say, you're never poor. You had sidewalk friends and uh, nonstop activities. It was just of the era, uh, mm -hmm. like all in the family kind of era. Yeah. You know, where you just played and you had fun. Um, and then as things grew, we moved out to different suburbs. That, you know, it never was affluent, but it was certainly comfortable growing up. Um, Dad worked late. We used to tag along with him to work. Saw many, many, uh, he was a wonderful human being. But, you know, the sales meetings and the motivational talks and the goals setting. I can mm -hmm. remember, you know, tagging with them, uh, you know, 40, 50 salesmen sitting around getting pumped up on an early Saturday morning. My mother was a homemaker, but went back, God bless her, to get her degree. She had partially done college and became a, a math teacher at Roper High School. Oh, yeah. It was a pretty famous math teacher for, I bet, about a decade. Then she went into computers in the furniture business, but very bright woman, mm -hmm. a very healthy 86-year-old woman to this day, uh, biggest challenge in life, hard to find golf partners at age 86 to <laughs> play a round of golf because she still hits the ball very well and uh -huh. can talk politics or anything oh, you fantastic. want. Yeah, she's in good shape. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was a wonderful family upbringing. Um, and, you know, I actually left town for four years to do cardiology training in Dallas, Kansas City. But okay. Before it was popular to come back, I came back. You know, you know now <laughs> You're all always the setting kids trends, are, Joel. Yeah, that's right. The kids are coming back now from uh, L.A. and New York and Chicago. Yeah. Because Detroit's so hot. But um, it's just for home. My wife grew up a few miles from uh, me, and we mm -hmm. knew each other since elementary school. So mm -hmm. we both just wanted to settle close to home. I'm glad we did. And this, the, your wife, you've been dating since you two Yeah, were we met young, in fifth right? grade, and then we started dating in 11th grade. <laughs> It's a funny little story in and of itself, but uh, when we finally were dating, the first date, once I got my grandmother's car and a driver's license, was Bruce Springsteen, 1975, cover Newsweek, cover Time, uh, had heard he was coming downtown. Mm -hmm. I grabbed some tickets and told my parents we were going to a synagogue dance. <laughs> so, anyway, not like we were really bad kids, but drove to the synagogue, got out of the car, stepped on the sidewalk, got back in the car. We were at the synagogue <laughs> and went and saw, uh, you know, uh, Born to Run had just come uh, out about a four and a half hour. At Tiger Stadium? No, or? it was actually something called the Michigan Theater, which doesn't exist. I would say oh. probably about 2,000 people. Okay. But it just, you know, he was a scrawny little, probably 20 
26 year yeah, old. That's early on. Yeah, he was. He's 10 years older than me, and I was 16, so he was 26. And yeah, it was just, you know, it was a great thing. So I guess that sealed uh, the fate that's of the sealed, relationship. Yeah. And 37 and a half years later, it's still going strong. I don't know your wife very well at all, yeah. but any interaction I've ever had with yeah, her she's... has been nothing. Yeah. Nothing more than pleasant. Yeah, it was we need amazing. to clone her. We need to clone her and get more of her. <laughs> She's a wonderful there, yeah. woman, and you do have a wonderful Thank family. You. Um, I, I read that uh, at one point your father had some weight issues or something like that, and your mom sort of yeah. did some research or and kind of to help him get on track. Yeah, they were ahead of their time, um, and that's exactly right. She was a, always was a tremendous cook at home. I just had the skills. Uh, but it was traditional cooking, not unhealthy, just traditional cooking. Yeah. And they went to the Pritikin Center, uh, which Nathan Pritikin, a aerospace engineer that in, uh, went through his own health challenge uh, in his early 40s in the 1950s, and by the 1960s was teaching people as an engineer about health and fitness and diet and very consistent with what I do nowadays, uh, early pioneer in plant-based medicine and yeah. fitness. And at the time, I think it was Santa Monica. It's subsequently, there is a beautiful Pritikin Longevity Center in um, Doral Country Club in Miami yep. now. But they went and the food at home remained very good. It just was very different. I mean, uh, probably one of the first families to have lentil loaves, not meat loaves, and lentil no burgers. Kidding. And, yeah, it was a slow transition. My what father. What year was that? Um, I would bet early, uh, maybe even late 60s, early 70s. Wow. Probably early 70s. Okay. Yeah, so I started to see that, and, uh, uh, you know, it did help my father, who had a little bit of heart disease, weight, blood pressure, you know. Uh, I can remember him smoking in the era that pretty much everybody smoked, yeah. but, yeah, he got it. My mom smacked him around a little bit and got him on better food and off cigarettes. And, <laughs> well, he, uh, and he was smart to listen to her. Yeah, he was yeah. smart, and, you know, had a good, good run of good health and yeah. great golf. And great business success for a long uh, time. Is it Irwin? Irwin, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and your mother's Ruth. Ruth, you got a good, yeah, very good yeah. memory. Yeah. yeah, she's, as they say, still going strong. My father had a great business career. Yes, he beloved did. Beloved around town, beloved in the national furniture yes. world. Uh, last five years of his life, he slowed down to play a lot of really bad golf, but a lot of golf. Had <laughs> down just, in Florida? Uh, Florida here. They lived uh, on a country club here, and they, uh, in Florida, had somehow befriended Mark O'Mara, pretty famous pro. Sure. His father was a furniture rep and a few guys from Detroit. And Mark O'Mara would hang out, I think, in Orlando at the same club Tiger was at. Uh-huh. Islesworth, if I remember. Uh-huh. I mean, the story, always stories. And then ultimately had a quick and unfortunate illness in his late 70s and passed away in Florida. But he had a funeral. I mean, to this day, I talked to my family about it, like he had been, you know, a cardinal in the Catholic Church or mm-hmm. something. Just thousands of people showed up at his funeral hundreds showed up at my mother's house for oh, a week amazing. And, uh, he obviously touched a whole lot of people some of whom we knew about and many mm-hmm. that came up and said you're you know your father gave me a word or a kind uh start in business or a hundred dollars or mm-hmm. you know, just uh, many many people that he had been you know not that it was a surprise but mm-hmm. truly uh, just so many mm-hmm. you know and that's what you hope for i guess yeah. Yeah. As long as you can, but touch as many as you can. We were just talking about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Gardner White Furniture is the name of the company. Yeah. And, big uh, family still around. business. And you, as you say, yeah. your, your family yeah, still Yeah. All involved. the competitors back then, and I remember them, are gone except for the gigantic, formerly mm-hmm. family owned Art Van Furniture chain, which yes. is now owned by Venture Capital Henry uh, Thomas Lee mm-hmm. uh, about two years ago, and the family sold. But uh, yeah, my grandfather hired Art Van as a. 20 year old kid who told him his name was Arthur Van uh, Elslander <laughs> and my grandfather who was even more outrageous than my father in terms of just personality and social skills said oh my god young man nobody can write that name on a business card let's come up with something and came up with Art Van right then and no kidding you know now there's I don't know how many stores yeah. they have and how many hundreds of millions but yes so yeah yeah, yeah. But, but there's room for, for, for it all, right? Apparently, <laughs> you know, tough competition. It is, but it is. I always amazed how many people are buying uh, mattresses and sofas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, seeing that kind of diet shift and what effect it had on your father 
as you were youthful. I mean, because you couldn't have been more than 10 or 15 in, in that range. And now you, you find yourself, you're in medical school, you're going into cardiology. And, you know, at what point for you did you start to s maybe see how you could pra potentially practice differently than your yeah. what you were learning from or colleagues or... There were just, a, you know, I'd like to tell, you know, the story. Many people have had a health challenge. Out of a health challenge, they found some information and transformed their diet, transformed their life. Give credit to everybody who did that. Or, you know, animal activism. Some people, you know, have, we have a guy in town who had that aha moment, became one of the world's most famous animal rights activists. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I grew up in a uh, Jewish kosher home and... Uh, went to University of Michigan in the first week, just kind of adopted the salad bar as my mainstay. Didn't call it anything. It was just food that was, uh, happened to be, as it turned out, very cardiology-friendly, healthy choice. Mm -hmm. It was kosher and salad, and uh, everything else didn't look so good anyways. Ann Arbor was a pretty funky town where eating that way was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And didn't think much of it, but you know, that was my girlfriend, my wife now, was with me at the time, and we just stopped eating meat in 1977. Uh, around the same time my mother was transitioning the home menu and then somewhere not long thereafter a pioneer named John Robbins whose father was the Robbins of Baskin Robbins and his uncle was the Baskin of Baskin Robbins <laughs> uh, had left Jeez. the family fold rejecting ice cream three times a day rejecting and they lived in Minneapolis that both his father and his uncle had had heart attacks and strokes in their 50s and mm -hmm. had the audacity to mention maybe our ice cream three times a day was the cause of all that and obesity and diabetes. And we're talking in the 60s. Anyways, wrote a book called A Diet for New America, which laid out plant-based eating or yeah. whatever he called it uh, at the time, probably vegetarianism, for the environment, for the animals, and for health. As much data as there was. Beautifully written book. I read it on vacation. And whatever we had left that wasn't fully plant-based, we're talking, you know, long ago became fully plant-based. So I did my, you know, medical school residency, cardiology training, you know, apart from my peers and that I was being uh, already very particular about what went on my plate. And then just the last coincidence is I started medical practice. I was in uh, Kansas City doing angioplasty training, balloon angioplasty, wonderful, yeah. wonderful year, Kansas City, wonderful town, but Casey Masterpiece Steakhouse Town, and I'm eating my baked potatoes and salads. <laughs> And I started practice back in Ann Arbor at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital and at the University, July 1, 1990. And I'm sitting on my couch in Ann Arbor in July 21, 1990, in the mailbox. I bring in the medical journals, no internet, of course. And I'm reading a medical journal, and there's an article that says you can reverse severe established heart disease using a plant diet, meditation, and exercise. And I said, whoa, I, you know, nobody taught me that. I've done a lot of reading. I've read, you know, John Robbins and other books. And that was the very famous nowadays Dean Ornish, Ornish. MD, as yeah. uh, at the time probably a 32-year-old uh, physician, Harvard-trained, from Dallas. At that point, he already settled in the San Francisco area, yeah. Sausalito, just north of San Francisco. And, I mean, I didn't know who he was, and not too many people did, but I knew his co-authors, many prominent uh, physicians and you know, it was like an epiphany because I said, man, this has been a really weird path from, you know, uh, the salad bar to my mother and father's transition to John Robbins. And lo and behold, I thought it was the hot shot that could take away any blockage with a balloon. And here's some Turk in San Francisco doing it with a fork and a knife. So I pretty much <laughs> taught people. You know, Dr. Ornish wrote a book in 1990 that did phenomenally well. Uh, Dr. Ornish's plan to reverse heart disease. So. I mean, from that moment, I had books like that in my office, and you got whatever care you needed, but you also got a little quick lecture on mm -hmm. the role of food as you know a platform for health, which you, you were it is. along with him. You were yeah. so ahead, but it, it's such a young age to be able yeah. to get grounded in that kind yeah. of practice. That, I just, feel like that was unique. You look back, say, you know, had I not gone to the mailbox or had the mailman not yeah. delivered it, or, right. you know, because it, it, it wasn't uh, circled in a bright red pen to be sure to pay attention. It just, mm -hmm. it just, I was the right person to read it. My peers probably got the same journal, but yeah, uh, they weren't, uh, you know, going to incorporate it or even consider it. Mm -hmm. And most of my career, I would sit in the doctor's dining room with my peers and no, I'm not casting stones, burger, fries, yeah. mac and cheese. And yeah. I'm, a good old steady salad bar and, and such, but uh, I'm grateful for all that, and it's caught up that, you know, 
medicine certainly supports the idea. Yeah. Food is indeed a pathway to health mm -hmm. and a pathway to reversal. So now I'm imagining you're pretty fairly young, especially as a physician at that time when you read that journal in Kansas yeah, City. Yeah, I was 31 years old, just just starting out. How did you have the confidence to take a road that maybe was, you know, I'm not yeah. going to say, I think it was unconventional than yeah. what you were being taught or some of maybe the teachers oh. you were with or yeah I, I never minded being a little bit outside the norm i saw mm -hmm. my father you know kind of teach us that do yeah. the right thing do yeah. what you need to do and yeah. it wasn't necessarily a popularity contest to make decisions you didn't need a, a harris poll to decide what to do you did the right thing um i'd had a few little uh, bumps along the way with my diet and my convictions the most interesting one backing up um when I was a resident in Ann Arbor, our chief of medicine was named William Kelly, MD, one of the world's most famous physicians, specialist in gout, wrote many textbooks, a bear of a man from North Carolina, I think he was, Duke, uh, just a you know, big, burly, tough guy. And if you didn't have your stuff ready on presentation, you were going to get, you know, you were going to hear about a double barrel. So I had survived him very well. We were very friendly, and I had always been sure to be, you know, right uh, at the top of my game if I ever had to present to him. But I won an award as a resident uh, for some research I had done on heart disease and diabetes. And it was my ability to go to Washington, D.C., present the research and bring my chief of medicine with me. So like, oh my God, you know, I'm 24 years old and Dr. <laughs> Kelly's coming with me. And the dinner was at the U.S. Senate building in the Hubert Humphrey dining room. Most elegant dinner I've ever had in my whole life. I can wow. close my eyes, I'm there. Because there were just people in tuxedos and sterling silver from Lincoln's time and, you know, pictures of presidents on the wall, as elegant as it gets. And I called ahead. And I was used to calling ahead by then or, you know, uh, email, uh, mailed ahead or something. And my diet was a little special. Yeah. And they brought these just sterling silver domes, and his was prime rib, and somebody was a... And they opened mine. It was literally Mrs. Paul's fish and chip. They'd taken the fish out. They'd put extra green peas, and they left it in the aluminum tin. <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's there. He goes, well, oh, Joel, that looks good. I hope they have enough that I can have. So moments like that made you strong, I mean, yes. or have a sense of humor, which I've always had, mm -hmm. to at least chuckle at it all, because it was truly a humorous moment. So mm -hmm. by the time, you know, amongst my peers, it was never contentious. I mean, I wasn't going to tell somebody that they were on their path to hell, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, food is, remains a very personal thing, and, um, you know, it, there is certainly peer pressure in a lot of things in life, but I never really felt it that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. were, were you in practice by yourself, or were you, did you have yeah. a group? Uh, until recently, I've always been in a group. So Ann Arbor was, I think I was the seventh cardiologist when I joined, mm -hmm. and a few years later moved to suburban Detroit, which for mm -hmm. those that are from here, is about 45 minutes outside Ann Arbor joined a two other cardiologists we grew it very big and um, so I've always been around other people about three years ago I established what I've always wanted to do but it's a path which is my solo practice of preventive cardiology and um, just you know at this point in my life it's just perfect mm -hmm. not that I wouldn't mind reporting to other people but you know I'm my only boss right now and yes affords me real flexibility and with restaurant life it's afforded you know the real platform to do a lot of things in a day because I call my shots. Yeah. yeah. Was your practice more traditional, although the advice you were giving might yeah. have been Yeah, I became little... quite a noted, I wrote many, many research papers on treating heart attacks of balloons and stents mm -hmm. and both the pros, the way people respond so well, and the complications uh, um, presented at medical meetings around the United States. So very traditional, on call all the time, driving around, so uh, it's fun. I mean, when you're 30, 35, 40, and uh, you know, one of the quickest adrenaline rushes is somebody in the midst of a heart attack, and 15 minutes later, your balloon has stopped it, and you can just see the improvement. Wow. I mean, you know, it's a drug. It's a drug that, you know, the right kind of drug. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I enjoyed doing that, you know, literally thousands of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do that every night. So no. a group, when you're doing that kind of work, is a great you know, balance, the ability to take a vacation and yeah. have good, good uh, partners that are doing the same did, work. Did they subscribe to the same 
diet as you or the same it, philosophies? It's, it, or? You know, it's a lot of years later now, and I'm friendly with all of them. They're not my partners anymore. Yeah. Um, they cover me. Um, no doubt they look back and, you know, would say he was pretty much on the mark way back then. And mm -hmm. we had a whole lot of stakes between then and now. We probably could have skipped a few. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't bring it up too much, but yeah. I, I'm very lucky that as I approach 60. I mean, medical problems, pains, aches, I mean, there's just yeah. none. And the energy is so abundant. And, and um, you know, I, th I do attribute a lot of that to mm -hmm. more than usual clean living. Yeah, you do have a great energy, and it's felt yeah. just being around you. Thanks. So the, you, you've got two clinics, the Con Center for Longevity, two, two, uh, two spots, clinics here in, in yeah. the Detroit area. Yeah, one in the east side of Detroit, yeah. Coast Point, and one in Bingham Farms, kind yeah. of a western suburb. And mm -hmm. spend most of my time on the west side. But um, uh, it's the most fascinating practice. And I've kind of merged lifestyle and diet and merged with science and merged with anti-aging science, which used to be pretty woo-woo, but it's really a seriously hot field right now of mm -hmm. people with serious investments in how can we manipulate, you know, either our food chain or our biochemistry or our supplements yeah. or our DNA with CRISPR-9 technology or something. I mean, there are a lot of people that say they want to live forever. They want to live to 150, and a lot of them have the wealth to support research to pursue mm -hmm. that. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's optimistic paths. I don't think anybody knows what is the single way there. I always fall back on I, when I lecture the public, which is always yes. lifestyle. You know, the, there's a word, show up to this anti-aging game, which is a serious field of science. Show up in the best shape you can, because I don't know if five years from now we're going to have a breakthrough in, uh, you know, in pharmacology and some natural supplements and testing and DNA repair, but there will be five to ten years from now tremendous advances. And, you know, if everything's aged, it's going to be a little more challenging to benefit from all this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a fascinating practice. But, um, I, you know, I find, as you're talking to a lot of executives, I mean, it's obvious that health is a absolutely fundamental part of peak performance. Uh, plus, frankly, the blunt fact, being alive is a pretty critical part of running a company <laughs> uh, and contributing, right. and they don't get neither peak performance, peak health, uh, quantified, absolute state of the art, and identifying risk of uh, life-threatening illness mm -hmm. doesn't get the focus it should get in the general public, but certainly also in those leading big organizations, big companies, big responsibilities, right. municipal responsibilities. So I'm uh, always pumped up about the idea that, you know, it's almost, it's almost irresponsible, and I have to be careful I say that in some settings, not to go through a better than average workup at least once to know where you stand. I have mm -hmm. a very poignant story this week, you know, on that topic. I'd be a little careful not to over-describe over because I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, I obviously can't mention names, but, yeah. you know, executives that just often the wife, the husband dragged them in and, you know, man, what, what we identify and the importance of it and then what we can do about it uh, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, reducing risk. There are healthy people out there that think they're healthy and they're right, and there are people out there that think they're healthy and they're wrong. They just haven't uh, had the proper pathway of uh, testing, and since heart disease remains the number one risk amongst all the risks, I am pretty much in the eye of the storm of uh, separating uh, those two groups, and it's tremendously rewarding to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. As I went through this journey myself, one of the things that I found was that the, the physicians that I was working with, uh, I don't feel like they really were in tune with it either, and they were just kind of, they knew their system and got me in and got me out, and it really took my own investigation to start figuring things out. So, you know, what are you, what are you talking about to people as far as that goes? Yeah, and you're absolutely right. It's a tough medical system if you're going to, you know, standard medical practices. If you're a person of means, if you're an executive, if you know the physician, you may get a little more time, you may get them to slow down. That's not necessarily fair. We're not supposed to distinguish, uh, you know, treat everybody the same. Yeah. But the reality is, um, you know, I can remember, you know, in a standard practice, given you know, a little bit more attention and time when I knew somebody was, you know, I mm -hmm. named somebody. It's just human nature. Mm -hmm. um, if you are seeing somebody that's in more of a direct patient care is the official term, concierge, 
cash practice or some hybrid, you know, you can get more time yeah. if you pay for it. And um, that's available. Um, sometimes you get more time and less waiting in standard practice. And sometimes you get more time, less waiting and what you might call advanced practice or integrated practice. So that's what I do. I do both. Nobody waits. Everybody gets more time, but they're getting a bigger toolbox. And, <laughs> And specifically, I mean, it is a strange thing, and this is always part of my standard lecture, is you know, you're 50 years old or, and such, and you go see the best internist in town in the conventional setting and not knocking anybody, but you're gonna get blood work. I can tell you it's pretty plain vanilla blood work. You'll know your blood sugar, your general cholesterol, your kidney function. Um, you're gonna get a stethoscope, probably for a little bit. That's, we don't give up on stethoscopes, they don't teach very much. You're actually not supposed to get an electrocardiogram anymore. The insurance companies will not pay for just the three-minute piece of paper electrocardiogram. They've evaluated it, much like stress tests, and found that a routine electrocardiogram, just because you're of some age or some setting, and I don't mind that. There isn't a lot to be learned, but my God, so we're eliminating that hard check. And beyond that, you know, you're going to hear about colonoscopy or mammography or thermography if you're a woman. You may get a digital rectal or a or some other evaluation of uh, colorectal cancer risk, but there's nothing being done nor approved for heart disease. And it's uh, a glaring, glaring error, not matched by the need. The need is huge. It's 2,000 people a day are dying of cardiovascular disease in this country, and the most conservative estimate is 1,000 of them could be prevented. That's the Center of Disease Control, Atlanta says. Uh, 1,000 deaths a day are clearly identifiable and preventable. Other estimates say 1,600 or 2,000 a day, 80% are identifiable and preventable. And every one of them is tragic if they could be prevented. And some of them in the corporate world are just absolutely you know, critical and frankly expensive to a company that is left unexpectedly in a lurch because the nature of heart diseases mm -hmm. it can quite easily be fatal without any warning. And uh, you know, uh, I often tell the story we have in Detroit, the center for creative studies downtown and a lot of automotive work. And the provost in 2012 was Imre Molnar, born in Hungary, but a very well-known um, car designer, engineer, uh, and such, and very prominent career, 60 years old, ate vegetarian, did yoga, looked good, younger wife, younger kids, and went on vacation December 2012, bike ride, never came back. Mm -hmm. Autopsy, 95% blocked artery, had been in his doctor's office a couple weeks before. And the school, you know, tragedy, obviously for him, tragedy for the family. Um, the school took a year till they could replace him. And, you know, from a fiduciary and, uh, and business standpoint, it was a loss in every regard. Obviously, yeah. the personal loss is more important than the yeah. corporate loss. But, um, you know, James Cantalupo, CEO of McDonald's, introduced the Happy Meal, introduced the Fruit Cup. I mean, he was trying to do some good stuff, was, uh, as you do, doing a corporate leadership meeting in Florida and collapsed in his hotel room and uh, died at age 60. And maybe the most poignant story that doesn't get told much, there's a cardiologist at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, uh, which is where I did my training long ago in Dallas, mm -hmm. John Warner, MD, chief of cardiology at a major medical center, president of the American Heart Association, who um, was at the annual meeting, and he was a runner, and if I remember, he had gone to the gym in the hotel, came back, wife and daughter were in the hotel suite early in the morning still, and just didn't feel well, and he collapsed on the floor, and he had a cardiac arrest. He's about 58, 57, 54. By the grace of God, his wife, daughter, you know, jumped on his chest, CPR. The whole floor was doctors, of course, so they started shouting, and, and quickly a defibrillator showed up in the patches and the, hit the button and miraculously came uh, back to life. That happens maybe 15% of the time, 20%. Those defibrillators uh, have increased that number some. Mm -hmm. You know, rushed to the local hospital, got a stent. But if you can be the chief of cardiology <laughs> at a major medical center and the president of the American Heart Association and still you know, be as close to death as you can be, we're yeah. not doing something right. Yeah. So with all that said and done, I mean, I've written books and I've written articles and I lecture. And I don't care if I'm lecturing in a high school. I talk about to the kids, tell your parents this is how you prevent heart attacks. 
Or, of course, if it's an adult meeting, they invite me to talk about nutrition. And I say, wait, give me five minutes. We're talking about how to prevent heart attacks. Yeah. Then we'll go to nutrition. They're sort of the same talk. But I have to talk the technology, the technique, the, the science mm -hmm. of not expensive, but a methodology to uh, wipe out heart attacks as frequently as we can. Yeah. And what's something simple that that somebody could do just by so yeah, yeah so I, I have adopted um, a three-word statement that uh, I didn't actually create but once you say it three or four times you know you can just take it over <laughs> which is test not guess test not guess you know because you can be at your doctor be told your cholesterol is great your blood pressure is good uh, you know you're going to the gym you're eating yeah. pretty well and you can be full of heart attack related blockage waiting to happen. Uh, there are things that are just not part of the routine examination that can be present, genetic and otherwise. So test not guess is what I live by. So when I speak, and it's important that your audience hear this, there are three or four um, easy, easy, low-hanging fruits to consider. One is there's a very, very unusual physical exam finding called a diagonal earlobe crease. When we are born, start looking at earlobes and don't don't start going around to all your sweet mates in the C-suite and necessarily point it out. But you shouldn't have a deep crease in your earlobe, both sides. It's usually both sides. And you can go right now to Bing or Google, diagonal earlobe crease. Go look up Steven Spielberg. He's got the deepest earlobe crease I've ever seen. <laughs> Turns out, a New York City internist 50 years ago, Dr. Frank, published a paper in a medical journal. When I see patients in my practice and they have heart artery blockage disease, I've noticed they have a deep crease and I'm pointing it out. It became known as Frank sign, except nobody remembered that single paper 50 years ago till the last five to 10 years when we've had the advent of what's called heart CT scans, CAT scans. And it turns out it's about 70% accurate. Well, that's as accurate as a stress test. To look at your earlobes is as accurate as a stress test. Okay. You could have heart disease and no crease. You could have the crease and no heart disease like a stress test. 70% is not bad. So I tell people, and I have people come to my practice, hey, I'm only here because I got dragged in because <laughs> of my earlobes. It's actually a reasonable um, decision to get checked. There's a theory why I'm going to it. It has to do with your diet, your fruits and vegetables, your vitamin C intake, mm -hmm. your strength of your arteries. This is your earlobes are collagen, your arteries are collagen. You can have defects and weakness of both, and it just happens to show up in the earlobe. No kidding. Number two is men, and you know many of the listeners are male to your uh, uh, interview, I'm sure, uh, erectile dysfunction. You know, it's kind of an awkward one, but I blurt it out. I mean, everybody knows what I'm talking about, but the inability or the beginning inability to have erectile function normally um, is usually addressed in a physician's office. Here's a prescription, and the prescriptions work, and now they're generic. There's no, uh, that's all fine, because they are safe drugs. But we've missed the boat that sometimes that's the first clue to vascular, to blood mm -hmm. vessel, to blood flow problems. Yeah. It just shows up below the belt before it shows up above the belt. And quite a bit of data for probably 20 years now, urology data, cardiology data, that three to four years before a heart attack instead of bypass, many guys are starting to mention that difficulty. And I certainly can verify that in my own practice. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with a prescription, but get everything else about to talk about. So that's another one. Then there's just a bunch of things related to hair, premature gray, premature bald on top. Um, actually, there's something about some wrinkles on the forehead now. Um, there is some really cool technology looking at your facial appearance and your inner age. It does relate to your inner cardiac age. I mean, it makes sense. You see twins and one smoked their whole life and looks 100, and one led a clean life and looks, you know, 30 years younger. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, some actual software that's quantifying that. So no pay attention, you know. If you're, so what do you do if you've got the earlobe crease, or you've got the erectile dysfunction, or you've got premature graying or premature hair loss? Um, two things. One, there is a CT scan, a CAT scan, that is now widely available everywhere. 20 years ago, novel. 20 years ago, Oprah would do shows on it, and you'd spend $1,000 to get a coronary artery calcium CT scan. 15 seconds, no IV, no iodine, no injection. Lie down, hold your breath, go home, not claustrophobic. Usually at a hospital because you want a big fancy CT scanner. The exposure to radiation is so tiny. Um, it's equivalent to a woman getting a mammogram to be specific. Some mm -hmm. would say that's not tiny, but women get mammograms over and over. The CT scan usually have once or twice in your life. And it allows 
a radiologist or a cardiologist to actually see the heart arteries. You can't see them on a stress test, can't see them with a stethoscope, can't see them with an electrocardiogram. You can see them in 15 seconds. And you, the beautiful thing of this terrible disease that robs people of their life is that arteries that are getting clogged are almost always calcified, bone material. And on a CT scan, you can see calcium from a million miles away. If your arteries have no calcium, and if the CAT scan says on it this magical word, calcium score zero, you have had the right checkup, you have a reason to smile, you have a 10-year, maybe more, but at least 10-year, uh, very, very high freedom from having to worry about the number one cause of death in men and women from uh, interfering with your life and your career. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a number associated with the abnormals, 50, 100, 300, 1,000, 1,200, 1,800, and it's partly related to age and gender, so there's um, calculators online. If you're 47 years old and your score comes back 84, you know, that's the 90th percentile for age, and your way is an outlier and such, you should be a zero, but in reality, it's about 50-50. Okay. Half the people tested aren't a zero, and about 10 to 15% are these super high executive in my office yesterday with a score over a thousand that that stuff has meaning that stuff predicts that stuff needs a very very intense evaluation and then treatment so half us get the cat scan the only people that shouldn't get a cat scan from age about 40 to 45 on every presidential candidate has to get one every nasa potential pilot has to get one every air force pilot has to get one these are built in everybody in the state of texas gets one free at age 50 built in their legislation right? yeah Cleveland University Hospital is giving away for free right now, but the prices come down very often to $75 to $125, so it's very approachable. I uh, actually volunteered this morning in a free clinic, People Without Health Insurance in the Inner City, I mentioned to you, uh, run by Mitch Album, the same oh, clinic. Oh, yeah, great. It's the only heart test I can actually talk to these people about getting. A stress test is a couple thousand dollars. They don't have insurance. 75 bucks, they can scramble together, mm -hmm. and you know, it's all women, smoker, diabetic, high cholesterol, blood pressure. The whole thing. I said, you know, seventy-five dollars. You know, get it together. Uh, this is a test. You and the chairman of the board of Ford Motor Company can both benefit getting. It's this crazy equality in medicine. Mm -hmm. The second part is advanced labs, and um, uh, when you go to that internist, family doc, even if you go to a Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Advanced Executive Health, because I see people. It's not really the advanced labs. We can check genetics. We can check all kinds of stuff. Uh, a lab called Boston Heart, a lab called Cleveland Heart Lab, owned by Quest Lab. So you have to school the physician, a nurse practitioner, PA, has to school themselves. What do these 50 data points mean? And that's what makes my brain right. smoke by the end of a, a week is seeing you know a lot of people going through so many data points and figuring out what does it mean and what can we adjust and what can we retest and improve? Yeah. But you really want to go through that process and you take the theoretical risk of the number one killer of men and women down to hard, you know, quantifiable parameters, metrics that you can work on. And they could be very favorable and there's very little to work on. I find something in everybody. They have mm -hmm. Low vitamin D, low yeah. B12, low omega-3, genetics. But there could be multiple things wrong, and some of them imply lethality unless it was identified through this process. So mm -hmm. I'm humbled. I mean, again, I can't say specifically, but a very prominent exec in town yesterday who dragged in the office by his wife just because she wanted to go through this evaluation, and a very wonderful man. He, you know, he didn't really kick and scream, but I mean, unfortunately, it became a very, very serious conversation about what we found in terms of artery disease and other heart parameters, mm -hmm. I think probably will be life-saving and whatever we have to deal with, we have to deal with, but lack of knowledge mm -hmm. is not a good plan. You mentioned the CT scan maybe once or twice in a lifetime, so yeah. it's, that wouldn't if be If you something. get that great zero, yeah. I will say proudly, I've had my carotids checked, I've got arteries at heart and carotid much younger than me, I worked mm -hmm. harder. You might want to, if you're a zero, do it again in 10 years. Some people will become abnormal and, uh, you know, will be on a higher risk plane that needs a little more attention. Mm -hmm. There's even, I mean, I'm not outside the norm now. I was 10 years ago when I was teaching the same approach. The American Heart Association in November 2018 said in a very widely publicized statement, if your internist is handing you a prescription for a cholesterol medicine, but you believe you don't have any heart disease, it might make sense to get this scan. If you're a zero, 
you know, eat better, exercise, work on your weight. You don't need a prescription drug necessarily. So welcome to the club that, you know, it's now being taught to primary care docs. Mm -hmm. If you're abnormal, I often don't repeat it. I've got all I need. You know, I need to keep asking you, how do you feel? Then there might be a stress, a stress test. The value of a stress test when you know there's disease becomes uh, higher and more predictable mm -hmm. um, and such. But there's very little reason to repeat it. I don't... Uh, although I get aggressive with my patients, better diet, better lifestyle, better yeah. sleep, better stress, meditation, quantified metrics on the labs. I don't expect this stuff to really disappear. Mm -hmm. We have clues from Dr. Dean Ornish and others. We may be able to halt the process, maybe even reverse it to some degree, of which I have many dozens of examples of making this stuff start to go away. But to really completely drain it out 100% and repeat the scan expecting the scan of the heart by CT to be dramatically better is not a data point that we really believe happens to enough to repeat yeah. the CAT scan. Okay. I don't want to give people radiation if they don't need it. Yeah, when, when, when you have an exec come in or anybody for that matter, but um, let's say somebody who has a lot of access to things and information yeah. and you see that there could be a problem or there is a problem, how hard is it to get them to consider to change their diet and actually follow through on it? Yeah. So I actually have a little poster in my office, the hard recommendations and the easy recommendations. The hard recommendations are to talk lifestyle, science of lifestyle. I don't, the fact that I've eaten this way for decades has nothing to do with it. Let's talk the science mm -hmm. since we're talking about hardening the arteries, atherosclerosis, and that goes back to the only science that you can halt and reverse this process through nutrition is plant-based nutrition, whether we go back to Mr. Pritikin and his amazing work, which is um, now funded by our government through insurance companies to teach Pritikin heart disease reversal in programs, whether it's Dr. Dean Ornish and same thing, our government and insurance companies um, will fund a patient to learn how to change their lifestyle if they have heart disease, something called Ornish Intensive Cardiac Rehab. Yep. Whether it's Dr. Esselstyn, the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Joel Furman, I teach it because it exists, and really what I ask them to do is simply watch the documentary Forks Over Knives. I have 100 copies of the DVD, but nobody has a DVD player <laughs> yeah. anymore. Just go on Netflix. Yeah, go on Netflix, it's exactly. There. Forks Over Knives on yes. Netflix is life-changing, it's eye-opening, it's accurate. Um, that's hard, though. I mean, uh, Margaret Mead, philosopher who said many important things, said it's easier to change a man's religion than change a man's diet, and so that, you know before the whole food war, keto, vegan, paleo, Mediterranean food wars began, but she was accurate. Uh, but nonetheless, I give people a little baby step, unless they're really critically ill, which is rare. Yeah, get rid of dairy. Everything you're eating dairy has a substitute, and not all of them are healthy. You know, nut-based cheeses, oat milks, uh, uh, tofu-based ice creams, you know, these aren't yeah. things I really want you to eat, but get rid of dairy. It's all you got to do. Or just eat an apple a day. Let's just start there. Or add a salad a day. I mean, we can work on fancy stuff down the road. I mean, a lot of these people just hire a private chef, and all of a sudden uh, they're on a, a better plan, and uh, they can eat well. But uh, that isn't obviously available to everybody. Right. Uh, there is fitness. There's a lot of people don't move. And, I mean, I've got standing desks throughout my life. Um, I'm fidgeting and moving all the time, but you know, I, I go for 22 minutes a day. That's what the American Heart Association says. That's 150 minutes a week of vigorous exercise. It's palatable, and do it at home if you can. I mean, get a trainer if you need. Uh, and the last one is, I call it the S's, the sleep, which is a big issue. I spent a lot of time evaluating, testing for sleep apnea, trying therapies, whether they be melatonin, magnesium, chamomile tea, uh, meditation, uh, blue light blocking glasses, binaural sounds, I mean, anything to get people to sleep. I've actually created a little sleep mask for people that uh, hopefully we'll be producing pretty soon. So I'm, because I see so many people where maybe the single worst habit they have, bad sleep, too mm -hmm. tired for the gym, too tired to push the donut away. Everything revolves around, yeah. you know, interrupted sleep. And you know, the iPad and the phone and everything have made yeah. uh, sleep an issue. So those are the hard ones, you know, and, and um, stress is the one of the S's, sleep is a stress. Socialization, you want to be involved, want to have commitment. Uh, the blue zones talk about yeah. ikagi, having a focus, having a passion. Then there's some easy things. There just there are some prescription and supplemental um, uh, supplements, vitamins, 
that have uh, pretty impressive human data for helping the process of reversing plaque. And mm -hmm. you know, most of the people are very interested uh, in you know, taking anything that has shown promise and safety and all. And much of these are just plant-based supplements that science has uh, identified work. That's easy. I mean, it's easy to take three, four, five pills a day. It's harder to change your diet and all, but it's that whole combination. And retest and retest and retest and retest. How your arteries look in carotid, you can do that. What does your blood work show? Have you brought your omega-3 level up? Have you brought your inflammation down? Have you brought your advanced cholesterol panel down? And, you know, whatever we need to do to get you there, we'll get you there. The, uh, at my office, there are people that love the keto diet. Yeah. What do you think of this diet? Yeah, it's one of my, it's become, I've pushed myself into kind of the central conversation. Um, it was on the doctor show, the yeah. TV show last week, talking about keto, most people. So for those that don't know real quickly, ketogenic, ketone bodies are a fuel the body will make under stress. If you starve yourself, you aren't taking in glucose. Ultimately, your liver, your muscles will burn through what's called the glycogen stores your body will start to make ketone bodies. They're something that will show up to fuel the body as you're losing weight because you're starving um, as a backup plan, never out of health, out of distress. And it was discovered in decades ago, children with seizure disorders that aren't responding, they tried to starve them, they actually showed it helped, but you're not gonna get much compliance starving children. <laughs> so a diet was developed, ultra low carbohydrates. So even fruit becomes suspect. But usually berries and greens are permitted, but God knows don't put a piece of pasta or a sweet potato or brown rice in front of a child like that. Jack up the fat content. We're talking butters and butters and meats. That's called the ketogenic diet. It brings on ketone bodies. About a third of kids actually respond. And if I, God forbid, had a child with refractory seizures, I'd whip out the old ketogenic diet. But the medical literature says that diet has a number of side effects very concerning. Somehow in the last 10 years, it's become the darling of Silicon Valley, Hollywood, some athletes, Halle Berry, uh, LeBron James, Hugh Jackman, Kim Kardashian, and it's gotten in the public mind. It's the single hottest food trend right now for manufacturers. Keto apple cider vinegar I've seen, I mean, keto soups, um, keto books, K-E-T-O. Um, so what's the downside to that? It's really repackaged uh, Robert Atkins, Dr. Atkins diet with a, you know, for some reason it's just a little sexier to say keto than Atkins. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Atkins had his phase, it's out of phase because it never was a long-term healthy play. Uh, remember one of the President Bushes always having pork grinds on the desk because that was kind of the Atkins approach. There is concerning medical science that the ketogenic diet, short term you lose weight, but a lot of ways to lose weight. Fast, water fast, get sick, take chemotherapy, all kinds of ways to lose weight. Long term it may increase your risk of dying prematurely. That's a scientific fact that's in the literature, but it's not sexy to talk about. So on the doctor's show, I'm the guy saying, I'm the heavy saying, it's great you're thin and it's great that your blood sugars come down. I honor that's a good goal, but if you're gonna lose years of your life potentially number one at least know it nobody none of the books and the sexy presentations on this have made it uh, really a fair and balanced presentation that this uh, risk exists if you do this long term mm -hmm. there may be something about going on and going off going on and going off and there is a plant-based version that has all the science we want that it may actually promote healthy aging. It's called the fasting mimicking diet. Five days sort of keto with plants. Yeah. 25 days eat your healthy diet, five days keto with plants. It's a, a genius of a professor at University of Southern California named Dr. Longo, a book called The Longevity Diet. Yeah. More science than any animal butter-based ketogenic diet program has probably promotes health. First treatment in the United States to be patented for promoting healthy longevity about four months ago. So, you know, you talk on the one hand, the best science says do it for a little bit and do it with plants, and you got the public mindset, do it forever and do it with meat and butter. You know, you tell people that their bad habits or their habits, I won't be judgmental, are healthy and, or, uh, you know, and uh, it's a great way to sell books mm -hmm. and develop websites. And, and does it have anything to do with just the, you know, the difficulty of giving up meat? Well, you know, it's Margaret Mead again, culturally, you know, we yeah. eat, you know, many of us eat 
just absolutely meat and potatoes. I mean, that's that expression still exists for so many of the patients I talk to. They're meat and potato eaters. Well, yeah. Well, it's it's hard to start eating broccoli and cauliflower right? if you've done it one way for 60 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's also there is a macho cultural meat, chicken, weightlifting, gym rat, uh, manhood kind of thing. And the irony is, so many of these meats are so hormonally and antibiotic, you know, kind of destroyed that it may actually be a, a uh, impediment in your sexuality and your manhood and your masculinity. But yeah, so that's why there's such resistance. But God knows we're seeing, you know, the food industry gets it. Uh, you know, although the keto may be hot, the plant-based food industry has just exploded. And you know, the the dark side, the less than healthy options. But Carl's Jr. has, you know. Uh, plant-based burgers now. Carl's Jr. used to be the single unhealthiest place probably a human could walk in to eat. Mm-hmm. They got an option now. Mm-hmm. And Taco Bell has and White Castle has and we're waiting for McDonald's to bring out their their vegan plant-based burger. It's in Europe. But you know, that's when the public three NBA players just invested this week in Beyond Meat, a plant-based burger. Mm-hmm. Kyrie Irving's their main spokesman. I mean, they the public is shifting, not always to the healthier versions of non-meats, yeah. but they're shifting to non-meats, and I think it's a phase. It'll get healthier and healthier. Do you think that those types of alternative products that are mimicking meat are still healthy, and are they still doing what you ultimately want them to do for mm-hmm. yeah. your longevity? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but I think I welcome it all because I think it's a it's a path and it's a transition. Okay. Just like I'm very confident, you know, if we repeat this conversation in five years and ten years and talk about what's going on in the anti aging field, longevity field, which is still based mainly on the healthiest lifestyle, optimal weight, the cardiac workup I described. If we talk about the food industry five years and ten years, it's gonna be shifting to plant substitutes and many laboratory made alternatives. Um, whether it be leather, whether it be egg whites, whether it be meat, whether it be there's pea protein fish, there's pea protein tuna just got launched. Um, the food industry pace of change is rocketing, and that will promote a range of what I might judge healthier and less healthy options, but they'll all be out there. Mm-hmm. It's going to take some really innovative people. You know, nobody can match what's going on now with Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, you know, becoming soon both billion dollar companies. Oh, yeah. The oh, you know, is... if they will just crank the oil content down a little and yeah. come out with, you know, uh, the Dr. Khan Beyond Meat Burger, Ethan Brown, I'm ready when you are, Ethan <laughs> Brown. Um, you know, it, 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 it'd be great to see choices that people can make, but all in this sector of not necessarily contributing to the environmental damage. Yeah. And, animal damage that's occurring. You, you mentioned the, the non-oil version. So what, what's your take on oils? Because yeah. that can be really confusing even for those that decide to have a plant-based yeah. diet. And for most people, when you speak to a public uh, crowd, first question a plant-based physician gets asked is, you know, where do you get your protein? And quickly two answers. It's all the protein you need in green leafies and beans and peas and lentils and nuts and the lowly white potato is 11% protein, which is really all you need by percentage. Mm-hmm. There's a, a famous Australian that lost 150 pounds eating nothing but potatoes for the year. <laughs> SpudFit is his uh, handle on Twitter, and That's he did great. it under medical supervision. I'm not suggesting uh, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller. Mm-hmm. It's called the potato diet. He hates when people call it that, but he lost and has maintained more than 100 pound weight loss. Anyways, there's plenty of protein. In fact. Dr. Longo, University of Southern California, will tell you until you're about 70, low protein diets promote longevity. And when you get 70 and older, ramp it up a little bit to maintain muscle mass. So we've kind of got it wrong, this uh, real uh, craze for high protein, which prompts the question, where do you plant eaters get your protein, is really the answer, hey, we're healthier because we naturally eat a diet that gives us just enough protein but not too much. We don't need to eat chicken breasts all day long for protein. But then the next question, and many of your audience won't be familiar, if you go through, I'm kind of the plant-based historian, I write these articles, it's just my crazy brain that sometimes, how did we get to the idea that we can reverse hardening the arteries with nutrition of plant origin, which is true. Every diet tested has been without added oil, and we can go back to the 1940s forward. Internist in Los Angeles and Mr. Pritikin and all, um, it was actually based in World War II. There was an observation in Norway 
that the natural diet of Norway for two years shifted very much to a plant diet without oil based on uh, the economic constraint that animals went back to the German Empire and that led one internist to run an experiment. What if I feed people in Los Angeles a plant diet without oil? Everybody's followed the mainstream. For most people, oil is a very calorie dense food group and if you're struggling with weight, you should watch how much extra virgin olive oil is. 4,000 calories a pound. Spinach is 100 calories a pound. <laughs> Think how many pounds of spinach, 40 times, yeah. 40, you can eat to equal you know, one uh, pound of olive oil. Let me ask you this. Let's just say you're at a restaurant yeah. and they have oil and yeah. the bread comes right. and you put it on the thing, you put, your, you put it on the plate and you yeah. dip your bread. About how much caloric intake do yeah. you think on general? A tablespoon like is 120 calories. I could easily see people doing four or 500 calories, not the bread. Just the you know, oil. The bread might putting... have 100, now it's a 600 calorie. It's like putting butter in your coffee. Yeah. Zero calories becomes 600, so 100 calories becomes 600. And that's the really, snack before the appetizer. That's a snack, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's your whole meal, ideally. Really, really fresh Spanish, Greek, Italian, olive oil, mm -hmm. extra virgin. Uh, limited intermittent. I will have really good olive oil. I will usually go to the owner of the restaurant, show me what you got back there uh -huh. that you just bought from the old country, and it's rare. Um, for the overweight, diabetic, heart patient looking for optimal health, uh, avoiding oils of all type, and certainly not the non-organic standard vegetable oil that gets rancid and oxidizes and is used routinely in restaurants. We have oil-free options to honor those people that come here and want it. Yes. But I can tell you, in the restaurant world, it's hard to do it, and most restaurateurs have never even heard that there's a possible concern about safflower and sunflower and corn, particularly. Every corn oil is or is Monsanto Roundup, you know, involved mm -hmm. unless it says organic on it, which mm -hmm. isn't going to be a very common restaurant purchase. So, just. Everybody be aware of the calorie density, and I would certainly urge people to buy organic oils for their kitchen to cook with if they're cooking with oils. We've learned in my house in the restaurant, we use vegetable stock, use wine, use water, use pressure cookers, instant pots. There's a, many, many ways to make great food that yeah. doesn't require, the way you say it, a little bit of olive oil on a piece of bread that, you know, it's, it's bitter, it's tingy, you can just taste its mm -hmm. kind of healing qualities. That's a treat. That's about as much as you need to do. What about oils like coconut oil yeah. or avocado oil? Ooh, you're getting controversial here, yeah. <laughs> so it turns out there was a book in the 90s, maybe, maybe the 2000s, called The Coconut Oil yeah. Miracle by Bruce Fife. <laughs> and I always point this out. It's sold on Amazon. It's still on Amazon. Bruce F-I-F-E. He's a naturopath, I think, an N-D. Mm -hmm. So the book he wrote before The Coconut Oil Miracle, which said you can cure everything with coconut oil, basically, including brain disease. The book before that he wrote was How to Twist Balloons into Dog Shapes. <laughs> and maybe he's just a very talented guy, or maybe we shouldn't take our coconut oil advice from a guy that knows how to twist balloons into dog shapes. I mean, he's not a prominent Harvard professor of epidemiology or science. Mm -hmm. um, just like keto, coconut oil has gotten into the public uh, mindset that it either cures brain disease, prevents brain disease, Indeed, it's not a whole food. A coconut's a whole food, and on occasion, on vacation, you want to have a coconut and drink the water and scoop out all that fiber and some of its fat content. Enjoy that once in a while. It's not a very common choice, but yeah. enjoy it. But, you know, coconut oil is nothing but fat, 100% fat. It'll be 4,000 calories a pound, but different than all other fats except palm oil. It's 85% saturated fat, the, the way the double bonds are. Mm. And we still believe the majority of the cardiology world that high saturated fat intake in foods like butters, like lards, like coconut oil, like meats, do, do contribute to hardening of arteries um, and may contribute to cancer and may contribute to brain disease and may contribute to aging in general. You eat a diet high in saturated fat, that's coconut oil in part, and it's meats and cheese. You get very quick changes in your gut bacteria that let products leak into your blood and you got disease. So. Um, the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and even some keto proponents, uh, low carb proponent Gary Taubes, many people will know the name, he written many New York Times articles mm -hmm. and many books that you would associate normally with promoting coconut oil, has recently added his name to the list until there's really data 
the prudent idea would be to limit or eliminate coconut oil. Mm -hmm. Now, in the food world, it's pretty hard to eliminate, but you have a choice whether you put two scoops in your coffee yeah. or not, or whether you use it at home. So um, I don't think there's moderation in everything. That would be a food I would limit mm -hmm. or eliminate. What about this trend like bulletproof coffee, where you put butter yeah. in your coffee? Yeah, so I mean, um, I called Dave Asprey a friend. I've got his cell phone in my phone. I mean, we've spent a lot of time together. I've been on his podcast, uh, uh, probably the only vegan uh, advocate on his podcast, maybe. I'm also probably the only vegan advocate physician <laughs> on the Joe Rogan podcast. And actually, yes, I'll tell you, which I'm great. going in April to Paleo FX, the first vegan physician to speak at oh, the great. hotbed of 8,000 Keto Paleo. I was invited to give a keynote about why I do what I do, and then I'm going to duck because they're going to throw <laughs> meat bombs at me. Um, I think it is a bad habit to do bulletproof coffee. Uh, I was there right when it launched. I was at a medical meeting, marketing meeting with Dave. The idea was, you know, you could load yourself up with coffee, his coffee, coffee tested for mold, mycotoxins, ochratoxin to be very specific, his super coffee, and it probably is very good coffee, but by adding in a couple tablespoons of butter and MCT oil, purified yes. coconut oil, 12 chain carbon fatty acids, um, you're going to fill yourself up, and you're not going to want to eat till dinner time. That was the concept. Next meeting I went to, everybody's got bulletproof coffee while they're eating eggs, while they're eating, you know, cheeses for breakfast, while they're eating a big lunch. It's what you said. It's all of a sudden it transitioned very quickly to just a hot drink that gave you 600 extra calories or 500 extra calories, a gigantic load of fat. And Dave Asprey knows, as I know, because we've talked about it, these high saturated fat bombs will change your gut to allow leakage of contents and create inflammation. Why you want to do that every morning, we all know there's no reason you should do that every morning. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem is nobody's had the moxie or the money to take 10 people and study what happens when you do bulletproof coffee to your artery function, to your gastrointestinal uh, and microbiome function. It won't be a pretty study mm -hmm. if it's ever done, but. Uh, it's allowed a proliferation of, in my opinion, I'm being a little brash, but it's the emperor wears no clothes. I mean, some of his other products I actually do like. He's a bright guy. Yeah, he's got the, the glasses. The glasses. He's an investor in true dark, uh, yeah. you know, blue light blocking glasses. I like and, those. You know, 40 years of Zen meditation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of neat things. Yeah. And uh, I listen to his podcast mm -hmm. uh, and such. But, um, but, you know, now we have the ability. The coolest thing right now in aging, I'm bringing this in my clinic, is uh, you can go, the hottest center in the United States for advanced aging evaluation has been in San Diego. It's called Human Longevity yes. Inc. by Craig Ventner. And they have a clinic called the Health Nucleus Clinic. And, you know, three, four years ago, it was $100,000 to go and get yeah. your genome. And then it was 25000 So I went two years ago. You did. And I dropped to four grand. So I've had my genome done. Yeah. I've had my total body MRI mm. without contrast. Um, a couple other tests were done because the price came down and I have a report that's 80 pages about every gene in my body. Problem is some genes are active, some genes are inactive. That's called um, your epigenetic profile. Well, there is now the ability to take, you can do it for your whole genome, it's expensive. Just parts, the most important parts of your genome that relate to cancer risk, heart disease risk, aging, and find out if the good ones are turned on and the bad ones are turned off. That's called methylation. and. It's spitting in a cup and spending seven, eight hundred dollars and getting a report that says you're 54 years old, but your epigenetic age is 35. That right now is cutting edge. And will it lead people to make lifestyle changes? Because next, what if it said you're 70 years old? Next time you come back and you've dropped your epigenetic age, because it will change with lifestyle, with supplementation, with sleep, with meditation, with stress. So yeah. there's, a, if anybody wants to read, there's a UCLA professor, Steve. Horvath, PhD, Harvard professor, a woman named Morgan Levine, and they talk about the biological clock or the epigenetic clock. They have a company that's out there, but um, I'm bringing an English company in to uh, start offering to my patients if they want to know. I mean, I do actually haven't done that yet. I want to know. Mm -hmm. Did do you find the uh, clinic in San Diego was worth the effort? Um, it's an amazing place with amazing people. At the time, the chief medical officer was a friend of mine, Brad Perkins. He's moved on. I didn't meet Mr. Ventner. I've read his biography, amazing biography. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's on the right path, but I don't know. I mean, their idea was 
these, you know, a total body MRI scan, which is a very interesting claustrophobic experience. They're like that. two hours in the tube. Is that literally right? had to tow. Yeah. Um, with music playing, and I was watching dolphins on the ceiling when, <laughs> when my head wasn't inside. Uh, with your entire genome, that, that could revolutionize predicting illness. Yeah. Now, it yeah. may be shifting that this epigenetic evaluation epigenetic age and they may have adopted that array they have the most genome sequencing machines i think in the world mm -hmm. um at the price that it i mean it might be under four thousand dollars now i can't yeah i know that. they were trying to drive it down drive so they it could down. have it yeah. everywhere yeah gonna get more but i don't know if it's flourishing or not so mm -hmm. bottom line is sleep well eat well love more stress less <laughs> eat plants ornish yeah that's <laughs> he, he got it right a long time ago and it, yeah, and now a, we can measure it better, but it still is the core actions. Yeah. What about calories? I, I always have, you know, it, 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 to me, it seems like people are always talking, I got to watch my caloric intake. We have people um, at my office that, that, that I see, and they have apps that tell them how many points yeah. for this and that, and they're watching their points all day long, and I think, gosh, that seems so stressful. Yeah, it is. There's, um, I mean, it's important. We've got... Uh, what are the numbers? 75% of the United States, either overweight or obese. Our president just made headlines because he was under 30 BMI, now he's over, so technically he's in the obese range. There are solid pieces of data that if you can maintain in a healthy manner your body weight, well, the BMI, the body mass index, 18 to 25, it's one of the predictors of longevity. Um, most of the blue zones, these zones of, zones of longevity, thin is in. Um, so it's in the mindset of the Japanese blues on Okinawa, this phrase harabachibu, eat to your 80% full. Eat mindfully, yeah. eat slowly, eat in a group, chew, and push some food away so you contribute to the possibility that you're going to maintain a thin body. Most of us do everything opposite, you know, in the car, rushing, on the phone. So busy. Mindlessly um, and, you know, barely chewing at all, and uh, it, we're, we're not benefiting from that so yeah. I would have a band that said what would Okinawa do WWOD <laughs> good. sounds like a CrossFit wad there mm -hmm. but um, nonetheless but fasting is the real deal now I mean that is probably the single breakthrough lifestyle habit sleep being the other one we're talking about but the science of Dr. Longo University of Southern California Sachin Panda a scientist at La Jolla Salk Institute and others um, the question is, what do you do? Do you do 12 hours a day of not eating? That's called time-restricted feeding. Very good habit. Nobody suffers. Allows your body to repair overnight. A lot of the stress we put on it from uh, sleep and anger and nutrition and everything. You don't need to eat 18 hours a day. It's, it's stressful on the body to eat the six, uh, six meal a day. Uh, kind of trainer gym diet is stressful. Uh, every time you eat, it's called metabolic endotoxemia. It's giving a lecture on it in Philadelphia next week. It's a stress on the body. 12 hours a day not eating is a great plan. You can do 13, you can do 14. Does that include when you're sleeping? Yeah, that's yeah. the idea is 8 p.m., 8 a.m. Yeah. It's a really good habit that it will promote uh, a more ideal body weight. You know, you can mm -hmm. obviously overcome it by several big meals. Um, then you get into the nebulous intermittent fasting. And right. many have said, let's abandon that term, it's meaningless. You have to go without food 30 hours plus to really get the physiology of fasting, ketone bodies. So 12 hours not eating isn't fasting, it's time-restricted feeding. We do call it breakfast, but it's not scientifically actually a fast. Mm -hmm. So there are people that will eat one day and skip the next, eat one day, skip the next. That's a life-altering commitment to make. There are people that will go a day, a week, and water fast or juice fast. Nothing wrong with it. The magic has come out of largely this Dr. Longo in University of Southern California. If you actually restrict or don't eat five days in a row, magic happens. You will lose weight. You will develop ketone bodies. You will release stem cells from your bone marrow that will repair injured portions of the body wherever they are. And in studies he did for 20 years in animals and now for about two to three years in humans, um, he's created a diet, and that's the coolest thing, that you can eat 800 calories a day, but you get the same biochemical benefit of completely fasting for five days. So you, you reduce your calories for five days, but you can continue to work. I don't work out. I've done this many times. And he's launched a startup about three years ago 
that offers us food in a box, scientifically proven, published peer reviewed. There's nothing like it in the world. Happens to be plant based, gluten free, high quality food, soups, nuts, and olives. So it's something I use in my office routinely as an introduction to plant based eating, as an introduction to fasting, as an introduction to losing belly fat, inflammation reduction. I mean, you'd be the last guy that needs it. You're <laughs> graced with a thin, uh, a thin body. I wore a husky bar mitzvah suit and am still <laughs> challenged by maybe my, uh, my uh, set point being a little higher than ideal. So uh, five days in a row I can commit to, my patients can commit to, and then they can go back to what they need to do, hopefully healthy options. Mm -hmm. So that's called the fasting mimicking diet. And um, uh, it's now showing promise, or let me at least say to be cautious, being studied in a wide variety of human illnesses from brain diseases to cancer diseases to diabetes and such. It's going to be a very interesting next couple of years. So this is something you've, you've tried or are I've done about a dozen times yeah. out of the last 30 months. Yeah. Uh, I'll take five days in a month. They have to be consecutive. I just open a box. Mm, there, it's kind of reminds me of being at the Hubert Humphrey Senate dining room because it's right there <laughs> under my silver dome. It's actually much better than uh, my peas and beans yeah. I had uh, in that setting. Uh, if you're not allergic, the kit's not going to work for you because there are quite a few nuts in it. Okay. Um, and actually, it's a, it's a plant-based, higher-fat, whole-food diet that <laughs> induces ketosis. But in Dr. Longo's view and research, it's better to go in and out of these programs. Mm -hmm. And it turns out unexpectedly, when you go in and out of ketosis with plant-based foods, the myriad of benefits are being described are far beyond what the original thought was. Mm -hmm. Many, many things going in your gut beneficially. So um, I, I find motivated executive type people look at this and say, one, it's simple. There's five days of food in these pretty little boxes. The same people that designed the Apple phones designed the boxes in the packaging. Mm -hmm. Two, um, the science is insane. Dr. Longo wrote a book called The Longevity Diet. Every dollar he makes goes to research. He doesn't receive any funds mm -hmm. from the people that purchase either his book or the uh, fasting mimicking diet kit. Have them lined up in my clinic because they really allow me to offer people you know, top quality science, inflammation support, weight control support, and maybe the opportunity to really get at uh, the very the very nature of why we age, this mm -hmm. process called autophagy and self-cleaning and such. Yeah. When you had this idea that maybe you'd want to open a restaurant that was plant-based, wh where did this start to kind of yeah. come up? Yeah, so everything optimistic now, this is where the stress part of the... <laughs> life and conversation. Uh, my oldest son, Daniel, has an MBA, was doing the accounting, working in restaurants on weekends, just working all over the place. And we started to chat. I mean, uh, having been in the plant-based world, um, I call it, I hope you don't mind, hashtag vegasm. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, you go through the airport, you you know, find one thing you could eat that was on your plant diet, you get so excited. So yeah. always searching, you know, all over the world, wherever I was, for interesting restaurants that supported my diet choices. And so I just been interested in food and every restaurateur I knew told me don't you dare think about it don't you dare think about it but you go to New York City go to Los Angeles San uh, Fran uh, you know, San Fran right absolutely that's pretty much been the list and the only list yeah. for years and years and we started looking at little options like a little juice bar and this and that it just it built up it, this restaurant we're sitting in right now was a small Italian restaurant with a liquor license that was on the market and it just seemed like the right choice about four years ago and we did scoop it up and got a team around us of experienced people in the restaurant business and particularly plant-based restaurant um, good or bad the building next door became available and we decided to create a big enterprise not a small enterprise so with a hundred seats um, uh, you know it's a big restaurant now and many nights we serve hundreds and hundreds of people and in the week thousands of people um, and it's interesting because it doesn't matter how good you were yesterday. It's only about how good you are right now in this meal. And mm -hmm. Detroit's a very hot restaurant town, so there's great competition for people with talent. Um, anyway, so very proud of three and a quarter years of what we've done. But tomorrow's a new day, and we got to get up <laughs> and do it again. And we're still learning all the time. Yeah. I mean, learning, learning, learning how to provide because it is we don't fry food and we're very particular about where we source and uh, it's not a clinic and I don't take blood pressures here but there is a feeling that this is a cut above and it is a cut above it is 
uh, in terms of what's available in terms of whole foods. And probably 80% of our customers that eat here are not vegans or not plant-based. They either got dragged along or, <laughs> you know, they're open-minded to the idea that a meal here and a meal there might not be yeah. bad. And, 99% leave here with, you know, this big goofy smile. And that's what keeps me going. Regularly overheard. Wow, that's actually really good. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and my main role here uh, is just schmoozer on the floor. And yeah. I'm looking for problems. But, you know, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's a very positive experience to walk around on a busy Friday, Saturday and talk in, to people. In, in where we're at, and I grew up in the area, so yeah. this was called Maria's Front Room. Right. And it was an Italian restaurant that had been here forever. And yeah. it, it had aged, let's just put right. it that way. Right. And I heard that you were opening, and I was so excited. No, uh, and I heard it was going to be kind of a nicer and higher end right. type uh, restaurant. And you got started on it. And then this other space next door opened. And you reset, if I, if I have the story right. You got it right. And then you went all in yeah, on we this place. In, I yeah. mean, if you're in Detroit or you yeah. live in Detroit, and you haven't been to Green Space Cafe, you, you've you. got to come here. Yeah. It is gorgeous. The service is amazing. And the food is the best. It's Thank you so very much. good. Thank you. Yeah. So what was this project like? I mean, you come from the medical world. All of a sudden, you're not just delivering on these this wonderful experience, but you have to like rehab these spaces, which yeah. were a mess. Yeah, these spaces <laughs> were a mess. And um, yeah, the place looks cool now because we just ripped off decades of stuff and found out there were very cool floors and walls and just left things as they were. Um, it was, it's to this day, I'm not gonna tell anybody, if you've heard the restaurant business is tough. <laughs> and, and I gotta say, uh, small is probably better. Um, you know, although it's joyful for the public to have this big, beautiful place yeah. and the 25 seat bar that's gorgeous. Uh, and such, but um, when you talk to experienced restaurant tours, I've been doing it for decades. You, know, you hear over and over, small, 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 fast casual. And we do have one fast casual restaurant mm -hmm. up the street yeah. that uh, has a little different vibe and feel, but also very healthy. So any future projects we do will be small, fast <laughs> casual restaurants. Um, you know, there's a need. Uh, God knows there's a need. You know, and the biggest, hottest chain in the plant world is out of Los Angeles, Veggie Grill, and. You know, it took them 20 years to perfect and, and open 567 in L.A., and now they've got funding and they're blasting off through the East Coast and Chicago mm -hmm. and, and such. Um, and many healthy options. Not everything uh, would be something we'd throw on the menu right away. Um, you know, but even them, their price point doesn't match Burger King and McDonald's. You've got a customer that's made a decision I'm looking and I'll pay for a little better, and we uh, deal with that too. I mean, we people want a $6 meal. Well, we can give you a $6 burger, but we can't give you a $6 yeah. meal because we're sourcing from farms and we're sourcing from many organic producers and such. So um, I'm still looking, you know, I'm very optimistic the way the food and the restaurant industry is going. It, it's so easy now to walk into a restaurant and have at least a few options oh, available. Boy, has it changed. It used to be tough, sure has. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the airports, and I, I mean, like you said before, San Fran, L.A., New York, those yeah. were the only places Pretty that much. get a halfway decent yeah. vegan yeah. meal or plant-based meal. Miami, now it's my Miami. God, Miami, Dallas, yep. Chicago. You know, some have opened and closed in Chicago, yeah. but uh, Portland, oh, my God, Portland and Mecca, you know, it's all over. I, I have to say I'm surprised at Detroit. I yeah. mean, we have a good number of plant-based uh, we do. Uh, restaurants here in the area as well, and, and I've always been impressed that they can stay around. It tells you we really have the market for it here. I agree. So you mentioned, um, can, I don't know if I would call it fast casual, but it's yeah. green space and go. Right. And that's a great place Thank you. as well. And like you yeah. said, it's, it's got a different vibe, but um, still very healthy options. Yeah. And uh, where do you Just see me. that going? Yeah, you, know, you know, if there's future opening, we had a franchise company in this week, uh, very enamored with that concept, mm -hmm. very uh, reproducible. So... Yeah, you know, we rushed into this. We actually also have a food truck in Austin, Texas yep. called ATX Food Co. on Barton Springs Road. I mean, really right now, those three enterprises, <laughs> so uh, you busy. I'm still married. <laughs> I still have a son I talk to, and I, I'm not rushing to. And you uh, have your yeah. longevity centers yeah, and patients. And, patients and, and, and by the and way, like and, five books. Yeah, you just books. wrote a great book, The yeah, Plant-Based plant -based Solution, yeah, so. and I loved, I loved that book. I highly recommend it. Thank you. The, uh, the um, uh, Vegan Sex was your first book. 
No, it's actually it's number four. Oh, that was number, number four? four. First book was oh called my God. The Whole Heart Solution. Oh, that was the f- oh, it I became okay. a PBS special for the That's country. Right. So that yeah. was fun. Readers Digest published it and supported me in their magazine and that's where I got the title, America's Healthy Heart Doc. Reader yeah. Digest was very generous with that. And then I wrote a little book, nobody remembers, but I wrote a book called Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, <laughs> yeah. which was self-published, but now it's published by a publisher. And it, everything we talked about for 25 minutes about executive health at a high yeah. level is in a book that's written very simply, hour and a half read, Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, mm-hmm. on all the major you know, internet sellers. Um, it's not on Audible, but it's on Kindle. It's well worth gifting somebody that I, for twelve dollars and ninety. Yes, and and you know we have mindful leaders listening, and I have so many mentors that I love so much, and would, you know, I look at them and I know their state of health, and they know their yeah, state of health, right. and it's just so hard for them to change, but their impact is so widespread, and uh, the longer they're around, the better we all are. For yeah. it, so you know, there's a statement I live by, and I love saying to the public. But it's when you have health, you have a thousand dreams, and you have poor health, you have only one dream, and it's true. It's, you know, I've I, I mean, I've had the privilege to talk to thousands of people in a very intimate way about yeah. every aspect of their life and relations and you know, performance and all, and. I mean, we have the opportunity to have this incredible life, and we're at the best time ever to really, really, you, you, you and I could be 120 playing tennis. Yeah. I mean, I truly believe that. I'm a few years older than you. Um, and it's, it, it's really on the verge. Um, I don't know if it's going to be resveratrol or metformin or um, rapamycin or some gene technology. Yeah. It's lifestyle right now, yeah. and it's weight control and plant diets and sleep and, and aura rings and, you know little biohacking it doesn't hurt but um for those that have not enjoyed that i mean it's really mm-hmm. a challenge when you were starting the restaurant and even with your clinics what kind of culture did you envision for your employees well i grew up in a family business and this is a family business my clinic is fortunately it's small and wonderful staff and we're very very close and loving and uh, they perform at such an amazingly high level of customer service. I didn't even have to train it, they're just good people and I hear it on the phones. I'm here, it's a family business and um, again, without it being too explicit, they know we're here for them, we know we care about them, they know that we are good grounded people in a business that's very tough that we don't need to be in but we're in it for, you know, some could say the right reason. And we've had wonderful, wonderful people that stay. I mean, it's been over three years, so it's not like tremendous longevity. But we've had very little turnover. And, um, uh, you know, I don't think half our staff are fully plant-based, but a lot of them have transformed their health while being here by their own choice. And, mm-hmm. You know, they love eating here just like you do. It's Thank great you. food, yeah. I, I, I said beforehand I was going to be your best customer. I'm not sure I am, but I feel like I might be I darn close. <laughs> we'll we'll there, go there, with it. There's we'll a thing called that. the Rob Bowl. I don't know if yeah, you know I that. Yeah, I do. I, I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> Max takes good care of me. He's the, I think he's the general manager yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have a story I wanted to share with you. Uh, there's a company here locally in the Detroit area. You know who they are, Quicken Loans. Sure. And I was doing a talk down there for uh, one of their groups. And they were miking me up, and I was speaking to the guy who was doing the mics. Right. And, um, I, and he, I, he said, oh, I, I'm kind of new here. And I said, how you like it? And he said, I'm really liking it. And I said, where, where were you before here? What were you doing? He said, oh, I used to be a, a line chef at the uh, Green Space Cafe in Ferndale. No. And I said, oh, okay, that's really cool. And I said, uh, hey, just out of curiosity, you know, what was the culture like there? And he said, I loved it working there wow and he said dr khan would come back and he would bring a smile to everybody's face every single time now, and that just not heard my that heart. story that just no. warmed my heart that's very very yeah. kind to of you i mean i have a lot of fun and they're great people and i don't mind a little street talk and <laughs> uh, I, I go in the kitchen and i hug them and you know god knows i don't prepare food and i'm in the way a lot but 
they know I'm around. Mm-hmm, they do. And, you know, your, your ability to live this lifestyle. Um, and I hear, you know, we talk at my company a lot about these. We call it the simple six. Yeah. And these are the six things that we all know we need to do, but we have trouble doing. And, you know, you've incorporated these into your lifestyle. And there's an energy that comes from people that do that, like yourself. Yeah. And you just feel it when you're yeah. around them. And so uh, much gratitude for, well, to thank you, you for that and, and for well, bringing this amazing yeah. place to, to our it. community here yeah. in Detroit. Anybody listening that hasn't exactly done the simple six, I mean, pick one of them or yeah. two of them or all of them. Right. Never too late. I mean, that's right. I mean, both science says that, my personal experience observing people. I mean, mm-hmm. you're three to four weeks away from feeling better than you ever have yeah. if you, you know, identify the right diet, the right sleep, the right fitness, the right gratitude. Yeah. And there was one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which uh, was a personal experience that I had. And you, you, you know the story, uh, but I want to share it with the listeners. And that was last year, my father had a second episode of, um, he didn't have a heart attack, but he was having chest pains and he was uh, taken to the hospital and, and uh, sedated and confused. And I wasn't in the same city as him. And there were some decisions that needed to be made. And, and uh, one was open heart surgery. The other was three stunts, and um, the other, which wasn't presented to him, most possibly could have been, you know, maybe to seek out a reversal or something of that nature. Um, He was under a lot of stress and pressure to make that decision and ultimately chose stunts, and uh, after, thank goodness, uh, he, he listened to his son and came and saw you, and you've been taking good care of him, but what it brought up for me was the pressure that we're under when we're brought into that medical situation yeah. and how do you make good decisions, yeah. you know, especially as it relates yeah. to the number one killer heart disease. Yeah. It's really tough and uh, thank God your father's doing well yes, and I appreciate is. you bringing me in. Um, but you don't hear, and again, I've been in it and I'm not dump it on anybody right you could create the argument that every heart patient should be presented i call it the three doors here's lifestyle here's stents here's bypass and never you know there's only two doors that are presented um but because docs haven't learned and haven't seen and haven't been taught and don't understand that there is a third door uh and in the heat of the battle um, I have people that come to me and are really, you know, self-motivated and I have to look at their heart catheterization film and stress test and occasionally the right option is to have a bypass or a valve or a stent. Um, I'm brave. I'm not always as brave as Dr. Esselstyn in the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you're taking a lot of responsibility when you're saying no to surgeons and stenters and yeah. come cook with me and you've got to make sure the person's willing to go through with it. Um, but you know, it is a problem. Where do people go? How do they get information? I think that's where the advent of the internet has helped some, yeah. just the ability to read. And that's why I keep writing articles about heart attack prevention, reversal, blogs. People do find that. People find Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Ornish, these classic stories of people, you know, a day away from bypass, their phone introduced them to the third option. And uh, for Jeez. many, it has worked out very well. We have a Detroit hero named Paul Chatlin that, you know, he's probably about five and a half years of Mm -hmm. walking out of the Cleveland Clinic and never had heart surgery and he can do yoga and play tennis uh, Mm -hmm. like the rest. So, but I by no means suggest irresponsible abandonment of standard medicine. I I don't know, I mean, I tell people if you've, if you've, if they've let you leave the hospital, get a second opinion. If you need to be in a coronary care unit for extreme illness and it's being presented stent or bypass, you're probably spot on. But if you're well enough to have the procedure go home and be told you're coming back in two weeks for this or that, you're, you're probably in a position you could manage it with medication and lifestyle, and that situation uh, could prompt a, a rapid you know, second opinion evaluation. Yeah. Just aren't a lot of preventive physicians in the country. There's more than ever, but there aren't a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for taking great care of my father, and thank you for taking yeah. great care of the the world. You're out there. Um, You can be found all over social media. You're very active and we're going to have all the uh, ways to to find you in the show notes. And um, yeah, I just, your passion oozes through and your energy is unbelievable. You're going to be 60 this year. Is that right? 60 in May, Taurus coming up. You know, 
I see further than others because I stand on their shoulder. Giants is so true. I haven't invented anything. And I also live by the statement, you know, be open-minded, not so open-minded, your brains fall out. Some people do need medication, bypass, and stuff. But there's this wonderful world. 1955, I'll leave you this last story, Eisenhower has his massive heart attack as president. They call in Paul Dudley, White MD, the head of cardiology at Harvard, who had basically established the idea there was something called risk factors, smoking, blood sugar, blood cholesterol, blood pressure. You can predict heart disease. It wasn't God's will or just aging. It was lifestyle, and that became fully established in the American art. And he announced at the bedside, a heart attack after age 80 is God's will, a heart attack before age 80 is bad medicine. He said that in 1955. <laughs> so I have that, you know, hanging. There's also a quote I have. Oh, you have that hanging. In my office by Bruce Springsteen, it's not your lungs this time, it's your heart that holds your faith from uh, 1975. But, you know, I just, I'm just trying to fulfill that vision uh, by Dr. White, and he was absolutely right. What did he tell Eisenhower? Clean up your diet, stop eating fats, eat more plants. Eisenhower lived 14 more years, which at that time, given his heart attack, was a remarkable uh, endurance. So, you know, I feel almost obligated that I have knowledge. I'm never going to stop. I'm going to share this. It's great. Yeah. And people need it. I they mean, do. They need it. Yeah. They do. Well, thanks for doing it. Thanks. And thank you for sitting down with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thanks so much. Yeah. You bet.